Hello, hi, John. Hi. So, um, Salvia's Traders Lounge is delighted to host you. Um, John is a CFA licensed analyst with eight years of real time trading experience, and he's also an accounts manager with FX Primus. So, just briefly tell us about yourself and what you do at FX Primus, and then we can get started with the interview. Right. Uh, currently, uh, I've been responsible for the, the expansion into Africa, uh, among them Kenya, which is why I'm, I'm delighted to be working together with Sylvia's Traders Lounge. Um, and right now, I'm uh, operating out of Cyprus, but I will come down to Kenya and meet everyone as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going to South Africa as well as well, some other countries in, in Africa. Okay. Um, can you just tell us how long FX Primus has been in existence and the kind of services and products that you offer? Well, we've been, um, we've been operating about 11 years, really, uh, under uh, some different names. We started out as a broker in Asia. Uh, after Asia, we, we, we came to, to Europe again. We've been operating under the SISEC license in, in Cyprus. Uh, towards different countries in Europe and the MENA region in the Middle East, um, also in China and some in Australia. Okay, so you're currently in Asia, Middle East, Europe and Australia. Right, we have offices in eight countries. Okay, but your head office is in Cyprus. And the HQ is in Cyprus, yes. Okay, okay, that's good to know. So what gives FX Primus a competitive edge when it comes to customer and or client focus as compared to other brokerage firms? I do believe that uh, many of the old brokerages are quite the same. We all have the low spreads because we're an old company. We already made a lot of money. Um, and we don't really necessarily need to hunger for money as many of the younger and newer brokerages are huge markups and um, you know trying to flip the accounts of customers uh, we have been around for so long that we are actually caring too much for our customers and uh, having excellent customer service um, on the benefits of our broker is uh, several things first we have the ib concierge tool so let's say that you're an account manager okay. or an ib with another broker then you're able to um, just take an excel sheet turn it into a CSV file and upload it into our database. When this is uploaded, it's no longer considered cold calling, so it will actually be legal for us to call these leads. So our conversion team will actually call um, the IB's leads or um, the account manager's leads and convert them under the, uh, the IB or the account manager. So uh, therefore, the IB does them. That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, that um, late, lately we have been really joining in on the IT revolution and automated everything. So let's say that you want to be a fund manager. That would be a, a one-click solution with a fixed primus. You don't have to wait one, one to three days for the PAM fund to be set up. It's the same thing with the IB, really. It's maximum one day, one, one working day wait time. And it's basically you just pressing a button, you get the link, and then you're able to, to start up working. Okay, that's really impressive considering I have been um, with some other brokerage firms and it took me months for me to get approval to be, you know, an IB or have any working relationship with them. Um, they were a bit strict on the verification of documents, um, but I think it's, it's a bit easier with your firm. So that's really commendable. And you said, I didn't get that. You said uh, FX Primus has been in existence for how many years now? Uh, approximately 10 in, in uh, several, uh, several types of companies. Uh, with, considering that you have several regions um, um, of the world and you most often have to be um, in different companies in different regions, such as China, for example. You cannot come in as a SISEC regulated company in China. You have to have another company there. So in all, with our concern of all of our companies, we've been existing for about 10 years. Okay, okay. That's one decade. So do you usually have training programs that give a sense of 
like a trading community for your clients um, with FX premise. Do you have that? We we do have we do have several trading communities uh, for our clients. Uh, many of them are our partners uh, that is operating on different types of web websites as well. Um, and just to just to mention, you know, a few of them. Um, we do have, uh, or we will have now, uh, let's say Sylvia's Traders Lounge as a community in Kenya. And that's really how, how we have been wanting to do the business with our partners because we want our partners to be, be a part of the company, just not to be an introducing broker that is getting rebates, et cetera, et cetera. We want our partners to actually um, bring traffic to the broker and in the return, we will set up the office in Kenya. So that's really, really, really interesting. And that will in in itself become a trading community in Kenya. Yeah. Okay, but do you have any currently existing, say, in other regions that, because I think you're just coming on to Africa this year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any existing trading communities? Absolutely. In let's, say, let's say Thailand, for example. Okay. Um, in Thailand, we have Dardin employees. Uh, that could have been Celia's Traders Lounge. Um, in Kenya, but uh, in Thailand, we have the same solution. We sponsored them with an office, and there, over there, we have 13 employees. They've okay. been operating for three years. Okay, you mentioned something about three bits, so we'll just go straight to the spreads and commissions uh, that you normally charge as a brokerage firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can tell us about your transaction costs because this is a very um, it's a very important aspect when someone is looking for a brokerage firm. So tell us um, if you do charge uh, the commissions and spreads, how much that would cost a client. Um, yeah. Well, it really depends on the type of account that the, the client is, um, is choosing. Of course, different types of client accounts have different types of of limits, different types of spreads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's important to realize that the old brokerage houses, we, we most often we don't have the lowest spread. Really, we, we usually don't have the lowest spread, but we have a fair spread for for the company and for the client. Because bear in mind, let's say that we have on EURUSD um, a high spread such as um, 1.6. Um, something like this, and you use this should actually be the, the most traded item. Yeah, in, it's the in, most in all of the currency care. So that that should have had, have the lowest, right? Uh, the problem is that when you have a low spread, and you have an IB, and IB wants to get his type of rebates, and the client wants as low spread as possible, and somewhere in the middle, the broker also has to make money. What you, the question that you have to ask yourself is really that if the broker has low enough spread and the IB is getting his money for the rebates, well, where is the company actually making the money? So the question that every trader should ask himself when they're always looking for the lowest spread is basically, why is the spread so low? How is the company making money? Because if they are not making money on you trading, that means that they have a conflict of interest that you lose all your money instead. So if you lose all your money, then they will just flip your account in the, in the dealing room and basically have you on the B book, meaning that the market maker takes all, all your deposits. And that's really like a trap rather than having low spreads. So I think that if, when you look at that broker, you have to look at, um, are they actually making money out of my trades? Do they have a, a fairly decent sized commission and do they have a fairly fairly decent size spread? They might not have the lowest spread. They might not have the lowest commission. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have a normal commission. We have a low spread. Uh, you can get it lower if you trade a big volume because that actually makes us into making money. So I think that's really the question that you have to ask yourself. Okay, so you do not have zero spreads, but on average, like how, how much would you say are your transaction costs say on any pair? It really depends. I mean, if you're trading with the raw spread, it really comes down from the liquidity provider. We're an SDP brokerage, so it, it's totally impossible to ex exactly say how the spread is. The good thing is that we're showing the spread straight off the bat on our website. So you can just go in there and check the spreads. Okay. Okay. That's fine. 
And uh, is your customer support team available for say 24 seven client support? Say if someone wants to make a withdrawal or a deposit into their trading account? Of course, um, uh, our customer support team is, is available um, 24 five, I would say, because we are, we are not active during the weekends. Okay. Um, also, you have to realize that it really depends on where, where the client funds is stored. Let's say it's in Barclays in England, then you, you, we are also following the English rules, of course. Okay, how would you explain um, slippage in, in your own words? Slippage, I mean, this is, this is really dependent on, on what comes down from the liquidity provider. If you're running with draw spreads, then you cannot actually blame, blame uh, either the dealing room in a brokerage um, because of the slippage that comes down from the liquidity provider. It's really about the order execution policy that any regulated company has to follow, and you will find the, the order execution policy on the website. Okay, so um, you'll give us the details of, of, of the website later on as we wind up. Uh, let's talk about leverage as a double-edged sword. And I understand that some, some brokerage firms offer up to 500 to one, some, some even 1,000 to one, you know, and for beginning traders, the recommended one, depending on the the account size, their trading account size would be even as to as low as 50 to one. So what sort of risk mitigating measures do you give your clients, say upon signing up, because some of them would not understand leverage and this would blow up their accounts, you know, in a short period of time. Um, so how do you do that? I think it, it really depends on, on the, uh, the experience of the client, of course, um, I would probably, I would probably not run um, even one to 50 on a normal account. However, what I have negotiated for the African market is now that we are able to do nano accounts. Nano account is basically um, the difference from a micro account to a nano account is that a micro account, you can open the smallest position of the 0 0.01 lot size. With okay. a nano account, you can open 0, 0.0 um, zero, zero, 001. So that's 100 times smaller than a normal micro lot account. So that's actually quite good. Uh, of course, um, you can still run it with a leverage of, of um, 1 to 50, but um, to be honest, I would rather prefer to run it with a nano account. I mean, I'm a, uh, look at me myself. I'm, I'm a, also a, a trader from, from the start. I'm an algorithmic trader. And in, the, in our system, you have an unlimited amount of orders that you're able to, um, to put up. It's really about the ticket size um, that's come with the lots um, that you have to look at. Uh, the leverage itself is not destructive if you have a good entry system. Of course, if you, if, if you have a system and you don't know what you're doing, um, then you should not have the, the, the 500 in leverage. Let's be honest. Even SISEC regulation doesn't give us the ability to give the client up to 500. You have to be a qualified investor to use the leverage of up to 500. Okay, okay, I got that. So uh, tell us more about your algorithm uh, trading model that you've just mentioned. Well, the algorithmic trading model doesn't have anything to do with, with FX primers whatsoever. However, uh, I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of algorithmic trading and how it works with nano accounts and why nano accounts is so important. Since nano accounts can open a position that is 100 times smaller than a normal micro lot account, uh, you are able to execute orders a lot faster and also um, a lot more orders. Uh, there is a, a belief uh, among people that nano accounts is bad for volume. It doesn't give money to the brokers, et cetera, et cetera. But let's be honest. When you have an algorithm that puts down 700 positions per day, even if it's 100 times smaller, it's still a lot of volume. And this is what people doesn't understand. If you're using algorithmic trading, then you should never, ever use a micro lot account. It's too big. You cannot put... 700 positions with a micro lot account it's impossible really i mean imagine 
you're putting 10 positions with 0 0.01. So that's 0 0.1 lot, right? That's yeah. 10. So now you're, putting, now you're putting 100 and you're up to one, right? Mm -hmm. So if you trade seven lots per day on a small account, that's, that's not bad volume. That's seven lots. Yeah. And it's way too big for most of the traders. To trade seven lots per day, maybe you should have an account size of a, a minimum 50K USD. Okay, so what you're saying is that with algorithm trading, it's more capital intensive than the manual trading, is it? It's, of course. And, you know, there is so many things that can go wrong. Let's say that there would be a, a latency issue and... <laughs> 50 of your 700, 700 order doesn't uh, execute correctly or in the correct time during news. What do you think happens then? You might close 50 orders on minus automatically and it will continue to go. Yes. So what are the other differences that you would say uh, between the manual trading and the algorithm trading? Because I think most African traders uh, locally are still on the manual kind of trading. To be honest, there is a lot of uh, luck seekers these days, especially in Africa. Uh, we see it a lot. We see a lot of people that are looking for the holy grail. Uh, they want to find an algorithm all the time that is going to make them profit and they don't have to do nothing. They don't have to know trading. They're just going to put the play and let the profits roll in. It doesn't work that way. If you don't understand manual trading or trading uh, overall, then you're never going to succeed as an algorithmic trader either because you might have thousands of settings that you have to put in manually. And if you don't understand what the settings are doing or what type of system it uses, then you're going to fail with that one as well. Then you will come back to the programmer and say that he's a worthless programmer and that his expert advisor is shit. Yeah, yeah, you. that's, that's correct. That you basically have to understand uh, the foundations of trading before you even go into you know a trading robot or whatever algos uh, do uh you talked about regulation that uh fx primus is sisec regulated the right. different yeah the different rules um when it comes to regulation on off on on and off exchange traded derivatives in in say europe and and the united states and most brokerage firms in, in Europe, not most, could be most, are actually FCA regulated. Would you be knowing the differences between those two, uh, SISEC and F FCA regulation? And uh, in terms of the strictness or the stringent in terms of policies, is that passed down to the client in any way? I, I wouldn't say that most of the um, of the brokerage houses in um, in Europe is in any way regulated by the FCA. I think that you should have to understand one thing. One very very sneaky thing that a lot of brokerages do. If you look at the website, uh -huh. there is one thing that you have to notice: regulated by FCA or registered with the FCA. We are also registered with the FCA and we have a regulated FCA uh, entity in another company that we also own. Uh, but back to, uh, back, back to FX Primus, we are SISEC regulated and registered with the FCA. We are also registered with all of the other European entities and the other regulators in different countries, even though we are not regulated by them. Why? Because the HQ is in Cyprus. Okay. Okay, did you hear so about... I think, I think uh -huh. also, excuse me. I think also that um, there is strict regulations, uh, really strict regulations coming down from SISEC, uh, especially now during MyFeed 2. Um, I, I can just look at when we had MyFeed 1 uh, and we had to remove all of our bonuses in the European market. This doesn't apply to the African markets, but let's say in Europe, we are able to give any form of bonuses. Any form, no cashback, no double dynamo. Um, they even want to shut down the IVs in Europe. But this is also why there is so much expansion coming into Africa, to the Middle East region, towards China and Australia, really. Okay, so these are fresh new markets, say, in Africa. Um, right. Which is what you're targeting right now. 
Right. I, I think that a lot of people is, is trying to uh, target Africa, but we are trying to do it in, in a different way. We are trying to uh, target Africa and to, to work with the institutions and the universities rather than just working directly with direct marketing and, and having a lot of these uh, get, rich, get rich or die trying people that's been around in, in, uh, in Kenya and uh, you see them all the time flashing on Facebook in different Facebook groups, flashing the money that they bought off eBay. Um, they rent a Ferrari and they take 2,000 pictures and they will use this for the two next coming years to do marketing. Um, <laughs> Africa is a very, very interesting uh, region to go in into marketing-wise, really. Okay. You would also, uh, you know, you should also be informed about the new licensing agreements for you to operate, say, within Kenya, because the Capital Markets Authority for Kenya issued a gazette mm -hmm. notice for forex trading in Kenya and those companies right. that wish to do business here there are some regulations that you need to comply with too so right. you should be able to find that online um, right because we are already in talks with this type of, uh, of regulators really uh, in any country that we operate we, we do it with the with the, the rule set of the country. Uh, but this is something that the compliance department um, does automatically when we go into a new country. Okay, that's good. So what would you say, because we're almost winding up this session, what would you say a good brokerage firm should have for its clients prior to signing up, you know, any clients? Well, first of all, um, you have the investment compensation fund out of SISEC and Cyprus, um, any any brokerage, brokerage house should really have, um, of course, uh, insured funds. Let's say that the brokerage house would go bankrupt uh, or if a recession came or whatever, and the client's money that is in the account should, of course, be in a segre segregated top-tier bank. Um, that is the, the, most, the most crucial thing for any brokerage house um, top tier banks, they should be able to tell you exactly who their liquidity providers are. Uh, if they cannot uh, provide who their liquidity providers are, then most likely they're sitting as a market maker on the other end in another company that is owned by the same owners. Okay, that's meant to protect the client's money, you know, to ensure that the client's money is safe. Right. The, the thing is that what most people must understand is that. Um, Right now, it's it's like a marketing thing to say that you are ECN or STP. But if you are also in another company that you also own Market Maker and you're sending all, all the orders into the Market Maker, then you're actually just a Market Maker. And what's happening is that you're only charging an extra commission on top of the, every order in the STP firm and you're making king. You're making, you're making double money. Mm-hmm. So unless a broker can reveal its liquidity providers, they should not be trusted. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so what book would you recommend to beginning traders, um, you know, for them to understand more about how brokerage firms operate and what to look out for um, when signing up with a broker? There is several websites out there. Um, one of them is Baby Peeps. Baby Peeps is, is, is really, really popular. Um, that's something that I would recommend for any, any new person. Um, but also it, it might be nice to also take local help, such as Sylvia's Traders Lounge, for example, um, where, where you are, because some things is, is not easy to understand if you're not having someone actually explaining it to you how it works. Yeah. So I will do, um, I will link the information about your website um, and the link for people to sign up with FX Primus um, at the end of this interview, but you can just mention the website for the audience. Uh, do you mean um, FX Primus? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, www.fxprimus.com. Okay, so thank you, John, for your time. And uh, we appreciate 
uh, the information that you've given us and uh, we'll, we'll do the link for interested people to sign up with, with FX Primus uh, using Sylvia's Traders Bunch. Um, Perfect. Go to goes to. All right. Thank you for the interview, Sylvia. Okay, bye. You're welcome.